where vast Ontario rolls his brineless tides and feeds the trackless forests on his sides. Fair Cassia, trembling, hears the howling woods and trusts her tawny children to the floods. Hark, heard ye not that piercing cry which shook the waves and rent the sky? E now, e now, on yonder western shores weeps pale despair and writhing anguish roars. E now, in Afric's groves, with hideous yell, fierce slavery stalks and slips the dogs of hell. From vale to vale the gathering cries rebound and sable nations tremble at the sound. where Darwin imagines the, the black beans of a plant called cassia. The, the, the seeds, the black seeds are sent by the currents from the east coast of America over to Europe. And Darwin has a very evocative passage comparing the grief that the parent plant must have felt, comparing that with the grief that parents felt in Africa when they saw their children and their husbands being taken off in the other way, in the opposite direction, across the Atlantic, to go to the plantations um, in America. It's a very moving passage. So, Josiah Wedgwood is best known for his blue and white pottery, but he was also a very, very keen abolitionist. And he was very good at advertising his own wares, and he also invented the first political slogan, am I not a man and a brother? And he produced um, a, a little plaque with a, a symbol on it, an outline in white of a, a slave with his hands chained up like that in a supplicatory sort of posture with am I not a man and a brother round the edge. And that became a very, very famous emblem of the anti-slavery movement in Britain. And Darwin, in his poem, described Wedgwood's medal, and he wrote, The slave in chains on supplicating knee spreads his wide arms and lifts his eyes to thee. With hunger pale, with wounds and toil oppressed, are we not brethren? And sorrow chokes the rest. I think it's interesting that it's very easy to overlook the radical edge of Darwin's poem. And it was, in fact, it was only when I really started thinking about the loves of the triangles that I went back to the Botanic Garden and wondered why it was that three political satirists should pay so much attention to it. And when you reread it and look at it closely, yes, there's a lot about industrialization, yes, there's a lot about plants, but there's also there are also sections uh, very strongly criticising the slave trade, talking about the American Revolution, talking about the French Revolution. In 18th century England, the American Revolution and the French Revolution were quite closely associated, whereas, um, well, you being American, you wouldn't call it a revolution anyway, you'd call it independence. But it, from the British point of view, the American Revolution and the French Revolution in the 18th century were quite closely linked together. So it was political about the revolutions, it was political about slavery, and then not in those poems, but in his medical book. He, he was, and in a poem he wrote later called The Temple of Nature, Darwin was putting forward very, very controversial ideas about um, the absence of God from the universe, about evolution from some sort of primeval spark. It was very, um, I think, a very strong influence on Charles Darwin, and certainly talking about evolution. Um, Well, initially, Darwin, Darwin was massively popular. He was, um, in many ways, he had the status of the unofficial poet, uh, poet laureate. Um, his biographer described the Botanic Garden as the uh, most popular and praised poem of um, 1792. Coleridge went to visit him. Wordsworth admired him. This new gen generation of young romantic poets coming up sort of you know, loved what he was doing. Um, but things changed very quickly, and Darwin fell foul, really, of the change in political climate um, as the 1790s progressed, the war with revolutionary France, 
um, increasing hostility to um, progressive science, um, figures like um, Priestley, Darwin got um, um, associated with, with Priestley, and um, I suppose experimental science became associated with a, a kind of dangerous kind of um, signing up to um, progressive politics. Um, Darwin was never very explicit about what his politics were, but nevertheless this was the brush with which um, he was he was tarred. Um, and his poetic reputation suffered as a consequence of that. Um, there was a spoof of the Botanic Garden, a spoof of the Loves of the Plants um, by George Canning, who was a Tory loyalist satirist, and he wrote a kind of parody of the Loves of the Plants called The Loves of the Triangles. And he said, instead of enlisting imagination under the banner of uh, science, we're going to enlist imagination under the banner of geometry and so on and so forth. So what um, in Darwin is a kind of light-hearted sort of excurse into a world of um, pleasure and botanical knowledge becomes a kind of a kind of eccentric, heavy-footed, um, ludicrous, um, ridiculous sort of poetic enterprise in this satirical um, attack. And it's very interesting because the terms of um, I mean that's a poem that came out in the mid um, 1790s, but it, it almost sets the um, it sets the critical term for the reception of Darwin's um, last poetic work, the uh, the Temple of Nature, which comes out 1803 after Darwin is dead. But the terms of um, the uh, critical reviews of the Temple of Nature really are picking up on the kinds of attacks that are made of him in the in the middle of the 1790s. The the, the loves of the triangles is rather like the loves of the plants itself. When you first pick it up, it is completely unintelligible. And the more you read it, the more interesting it becomes. It didn't come out straight away. It didn't come out until after Darwin had published a medical textbook called Zoonomia, in which he puts forward certain hypotheses about evolution and the age of the earth, which seemed very sacrilegious, very controversial at the time. I think they, they were not, the people who wrote The Loves of the Plants, there were three young men, um, and it was published in a journal, a journal called the Anti-Jacobin Review. It was a very Tory uh, journal, and I think what they did was pick on Darwin as a figurehead of radical thought. So they weren't so much criticising the ideas that he put in his poem, they, they were using his poem, they were satirising his poem to explain to people the risks, the dangers of following the French Revolution. At first, when the French Revolution first broke out, people in Britain were quite supportive, but then there was a huge reaction against it, because everybody worried that all this lawlessness, the reign of terror, would come over here, and all the, anything that had the va vaguely smacked of revolutionary ideas was seen by a conservative group of people as being very, very abhorrent. So the loves of the triangles, it was a sat very, very clever, witty, funny satire on the loves of the triangles, you can tell from the name, but it was published quite a while after the loves of the triangles, and and it was just using Darwin as uh, as a as a token um, to shoot down um, to shoot down these new ideas. It was a very pro-establishment, pro-church, pro-king poem. Well, the Anti-Jacobin was a magazine sponsored by the government, very much trying to counter tendencies that sympathised with the French Revolution, which had um, by, this was by the late 1790s. Um, initial enthusiasm, which was very widely shared in England for the French Revolution, had long ago tipped over into horror at uh, the bloodiness, the excesses, the extremes to which it went, and the fact that we were uh, now at war with France. Um, there was a sense, as it were, that there was a kind of a chattering classes, liberal, lefty consensus that was still out there that needed to be sort of pointed out, that needed to be singled out, that needed to be demonised. Uh, and, and there were many, many treason trials for people of um, um, duly pro-French sympathies. Uh, Darwin himself was actually connected to the uh, a Derby Society for Political Information, which did come close to prosecution. It was recommending things like um, universal vote, for instance. Uh, so he had long been identified as a, 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 a dangerously anti 
anti-Tory at least, um, anti-reactionary writer, and the name of the anti-Jacobin magazine is absolutely clear. It tars these British intellectuals as Jacobins, the most bloody wing of the French Revolution. But it does it with great lightness and humour. Uh, and the one of its most famous parodies, probably its most famous parody, was The Loves of the Triangles, which was uh, a send-up of Erasmus Darwin's The Loves of the Plants, in which pistols and stamens fall in love with each other in clearly artificial, clearly nonsensical ways with lightness and grace in uh, Darwin's poem. This is kind of pushed just over the edge into total absurdity by making triangles fall in love with parabolas and so forth. Uh, and the underlying theme is, oh, scientific minds can't be trusted. They just think science is all there is. They may be light, they may, they may sound graceful and amusing, but underneath they've got this hard, steely core and they'd be perfectly happy to see uh, the king being executed. Pitt, the climax is Pitt, the prime minister, being executed uh, on a guillotine as Erasmus Darwin-like sylphs simper and chortle in the background as if it was just a bit of light fun. So they're very clever. They say that by putting things across as light fun, he is disguising the fact that there are really dangerous things going on in his poetry. And one of the most dangerous things is irreligion, infidelism, atheism, materialism. Uh, there are notes, quite often pretty deadly notes, to the loves of the triangles, again, in imitation of the loves of the plants, but bringing out the kind of mad materialism that the authors are reading into Darwin's poem. So, and that had a huge effect. And, I mean, a thing that has particularly interested me is that um, he was working on a much more political poem when that came out um, and ditched it. He turned it into what is still a very con interestingly controversial poem, his scientific poem about evolution, um, as we would call it now, which completely looks forward to a great many of his grandson Charles's ideas about evolution. Um, but he pulls back on the politics, so it did have an effect. Oh, I think Loves of the Triangles is really, really witty and clever. Uh, a lot of the jokes I don't think I will ever understand. I don't think any of us will. I think it's a bit like if you, if you picked up in two or three hundred years' time, you picked up a copy of a satirical paper or you watched a satirical t weekly television news programme. It would be very difficult to pick all the references up. It's also complicated because it assumes that you're seeped in 18th century culture, so there are a lot of re Latin references and Latin puns, which I sort of worked out a few of them. So it is, it is a difficult poem, but I'm... The sort of energy and enthusiasm, these three young men, what, what they did was they had a, they had a, a printing shop, um, a sort of editorial room on top of another shop, and they tried to keep it secret. So to get there, they had to climb up a little staircase, and they had a central table, and they left the poem, The Loves of the Triangles, they left it on the table, and whenever one of them had an idea, he would come in and sort of scribble down. So you can, you can see sort of ten lines of one person, and it switches to someone else. And you can just imagine them. I mean, it must have been such fun, and you can just imagine them up there, pr probably with quite a lot of beer, and sort of joking and messing around and writing this poem. It is so funny and so clever. I think it, I think it's very interesting that uh, modern commentators haven't really noticed how political it was. And I first I got put onto that partly by um, the loves of the triangles, but also we were talking about serendipity. And I ordered up from the University Library at Cambridge uh, an original, an, an old copy of the poem. And when I opened it up, I was actually stunned because there was a sheet of handwritten notes inside. And I realised they were notes by a poet called Matthew Cooper. Uh, they, were, they were notes um, that he was preparing to write a review of the poem. And he didn't highlight any of the things that I knew about, about industrialisation or oxygen or anything like that. 
that all the lines that he liked, highlighted were about slavery and about the expansion of the British Empire. And that was because he was a very keen abolitionist. So whereas I'd been primed to think about the Lunar Society as the foundation for our modern society, so whenever I looked at the poem, I was interested for evidence of that. When he looked at the poem, he saw something completely different. So I went back to the poem and tried to look at it with his eyes. So it's a very good example of how serendipity operates, I think. Thank you.